why, why freezing hell over? Um, because um, the possibility of a Dpackage 2 ever being released would probably happen when that happens, <laughs> if anyone's followed the recent developments. So anyway, good morning. Um, I'm going to be giving you a little talk on Dpackage and um, possible, probable um, features coming up in it for later releases. And um, the, obviously, the title Freezing Hell Over refers to Dpackage 2. Um, the um, pretty way we're going to do this is if you have any questions at any point during the talk, just stick your hand up and this lovely gentleman will run to you as fast as he can with the microphone and probably fall over and then we'll, I'll just repeat the question when he's... <laughs> and um, so, just going to quickly check. Uh, everybody here does actually know what dpackage is, right? No, uh, okay. It <laughs> yes. <laughs> In a sort of not quite a way. Um, good. That's uh, pretty soon. Um, probably you're all aware of the history of um, dpackage as well. It was uh, originally a Perl script written by a couple of people, including Ian Murdoch. And... Um, a certain individual known as Ian Jackson, who's probably falling asleep just up there as we speak, um, decided to write the currency implementation we've all been using for about the last 10 years. Um, and it's been maintained by a variety of different individuals over the years, um, from sort of people like Guy Maurer, Ben Collins, Vicky Ackerman, who's also sitting there. So I have the original author and previous maintainer in the room, so I'm going to be feeling intimidated through this talk. <laughs> um, so yes, it's... Uh, the package manager we all use in Debian, it's the thing that actually sticks the stuff on your system. You should all know this. So um, what the talk is probably going to be is looking at what we, where we can take dpackage. The existing code's worked for 10 years. It's got quirks, it's got bugs, it's got problems. But by and by, the actual implementation has been pretty good. The code isn't, but the implementation is pretty good. So the first important thing, the first important slide is actually what isn't going to change. Um, the, so it does actually work. Um, yeah, the um, first most obvious thing we're actually not going to change about this thing is um, package states. The things like um, the half installed, installed, configured, all the various in little states the packages go through, because these actually fundamentally work. Um, we don't really want to go messing around and try and RPMize it or anything like that. Um, the fundamental sort of basics of dpackage, the way it unpacks packages, the way it then configures them and stuff like this is very elegant. It's served us well for 10 years, and I think it'll serve us for another 10 or 20 years further. Um, the design's very good. Um, on the other hand, the process of moving between a couple of these states could be cleaned up a little bit, which is pr pretty much the fundamental core of this um, slide. Um, one thing I'm actually going to do is a quick little demo here. I want to see how many people knew you could do this with dpackage. Um, as an explanation of why the package states are really good and useful. So hopefully I've got a terminal here somewhere that's not going to be the terminal on the screen. Woohoo! <laughs> so, um, it needs to be root. This is the one disadvantage of dual head. I'm going to do that. Yeah. So, um, let's, how many people here have ever encountered the situation where you've got a deb on your disk and you want to install it and um, you don't really know where the dependencies are and stuff like that? Everyone's encountered this situation? How many people know how to do that? Mm. How do you, okay, um, Tom, how would you do it? <laughs> One way. Um, or you could just sort of tell the package just to unpack it, and that will uh, select, do, do half of the job. <laughs> you know those, this one comes up in a later slide, the whole, the fact it takes half a week to read its own database. <laughs> I just use the word Ian. <laughs> well, it doesn't have the control G's and the control D's and the control C's of <laughs> some other Ian. Well, it, sorry. Hmm? No, it's, it's just taking ages. <laughs> it's just taking a very lot of ages. So there we go. We, it will unpack, and um, it just leaves us unpacked. And uh, if you actually look at the status of file light at the moment, it's, uh, it's left. In, you want it to be installed, it's OK, and it's going to be unpacked. And as Tom said, you can actually just go apt, apt, can you fix it? And uh, apt will take slightly less time, and apt will want to 
install a bunch of new packages for it. So it's a kind of cute way of working. And I mean, this way of working, the fact you can unpack packages without their dependencies on the system, and then because you only need them to configure them, and stuff like this, is actually what buys us Debian's great ability to merge, move between different distributions and pick between them, and stuff like this. Sure. As long as you don't mind waiting for the database to be read. <laughs> there you go. So you, you can remove it. You can down if you want to downgrade it to the previous version. You can do that. Um, you, it's uh, pretty. So the, the, the states that the package goes through for an individual package are elegant. They're simple, and they bias a lot. I mean, one of the general complaints tends to be that um, the package is an atomic. If you try and do an upgrade and you don't have the dependencies, um, it leaves you in an invalid state. Where in fact, actually, it's a perfectly valid state for dpackaged packages to be in. It's just unpacked or half installed, it's just not configured yet, it lets you go and fix the dependencies and then just configure it without having to find the deb you installed in the first place. Um, the, the, the level of, sort of user automaticity on top of it is something apt and deselect and front ends can provide for it rather than internally. Um, other things that aren't going to be changed, the existing interpackage relationships, um, things like depends and recommends and suggests and everything else like that, they work. I think we've got a much richer metadata format than um, things like RPM, and I think we've sort of had a good run with that, and I think, in general, fundamentally, it's not actually that broken. It, well, it's not broken at all, actually, I don't think. There's a few tweaks and improvements we can make. I mean, quite an often a requested one is um, version provides and stuff like that. There's vague requests for things like architecture, specific dependencies and uh, conditional dependencies and things like that we can extend. Um, various ones of these have problems with syntax or basically just making it not suck as kind of to use. But um, it's, in general, it's sort of, it, they, they, they kind of work. Um, the, you know, there's a problem, we might add a couple of uh, new relationships to the, to the thing. Um, one common one that we, we've talked about quite a lot is um, breaks. Um, breaks was actually um, one of Ian's proposals long, long ago that's just never been implemented. Um, Basically, a breaks is to conflicts as depends is to predefends. In other words, um, a lot of people at the moment conflict a package which has a bug in it um, to try and avoid their package and that package being installed at the same time. But what this actually means is that you have to rip out the other package first, remove it completely, and then install the later version later during an upgrade, which is quite evil. Um, where a breaks would actually allow the two to be unpacked but not configured at the same time, so an upgrade could be done a lot smoother with it. Um, there's also um, enhances, which will be a new field. When you, you know, some people who follow policy might not think so, but um, in, in general, the dpackage support for enhances is non-existent. But actually, I think dpackage could actually support it quite usefully. Um, if a package declares an enhances on another package, there's no particular reason why those packages post ints couldn't be run with an enhance flag. To so you, if you say you enhance another package, you get the opportunity to do it. Um, this can be quite useful, things like spell checkers and things like that, where they can say you have a generic language pack, spell checking, dictionary thing, which enhances OpenOffice and Mozilla, and then it's post inst it could catch the enhance sort of um, argument and go away and actually do whatever it needs in the post inst to hook itself into said sort of packages. Um, but again, the existing relationships won't actually need to change. Um, sorry? Hello? <coughs> It indeed, yes. It's not new at all, no. No. Um, where are we going? Uh, yep. Yeah, it's, it's, it's backwards. Um, suggest? Sorry, yeah, the question was, was enhances semantically different from um, suggests? In the, it's in the other direction, yes. It suggests in the other direction. Um, um, if A suggests B, then in theory B enhances A, but enhances also gives the opportunity for B and A to know about it when each other is installed. It's the, 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 the intended theory. Um, the, um, so, yeah, with the maintainer scripts and arguments again, um, I think we've got a pretty good, rich way of um, dealing with package installation. Uh, pre-inst, post-inst, pre-RM, post-RM, they kind of are the four basic things to go through, and we managed to kind of stick arguments in these to allow us pretty much flexibility. Um, could be a little bit of documented for people, there could be some 
sort of examples to give around, but there's actually nothing fundamentally wrong with it. I think sort of stuffing it all into one big script or spreading it out into 100 would actually make things a lot worse than they are now. Um, so again, I don't think we need, really need to change anything like that. Um, the um, Debian rules won't change. You know, it's an executable make file. I think that's pretty much served as well. Um, I don't think sticking everything into kind of um, one file or multiple files again is going to make anything easier. Um, make files are reasonably flexible. Um, we could, you know, it, it, the package doesn't particularly care that it's a make file, to be honest. Um, that it can be any, pretty much any executable, but policy mandates make files. But again, I don't see any reason to kind of go from that to a um, different source format, like a spec file or anything like that. Um, the only thing, I do, there's a little note on the bottom there that um, you'll see there's uh, changes, possibly changes to the source package format, which will be sort of where the tarballs and patches actually go. Um, anyone who was following Debian Devel Announce, who will probably know about the wig and pen format that Brendan O'Day and Elmo and myself kind of came up with in a pub one night. Um, and um, that's most good things that are actually developed. Um, and that's basically, it's again, it's not really changing much. It's just improving little bits where around the edges where they needed to be. Basically, allowing changing a diff to a tarball of patches is the fundamental change to it. Um, which pretty much, again, the existing kind of stuff was pretty well designed. Um, I'm going to skip over that bit for now. Right, so uh, the one thing I do say, um, I did say right at the, the top was um, that although we, you know, changing the existing package relation sort of uh, status is so the package goes to unpacked to installed. Um, if you break it, it can drop to half installed and can be deconfigured and stuff like that. It generally works. I mean, <coughs> it's given us the great flexibility to build things like apt and deselect and stuff, which, you know, we have, I think, um, nobody in the room would deny we have probably the most unparalleled, unrivaled kind of ability to upgrade and downgrade, and you can switch between Debian distributions and you can switch between Debian derivatives quite easily within this model, and it generally seems to work. Um, but um, the one thing I did want to kind of look at is um, how you unpack and how you remove sort of packages, because uh, that kind of stuff at the moment is um, a little hairy. Sometimes it doesn't quite work right, or this. Anyone who goes through the bug tracking system will see long lists of bugs where things like diverts do exactly the wrong thing in most circumstances and uh, you know, things like that. Um, so there's probably a way to clean this all up. So there's uh, two base. Hmm? Did someone shout something? Nope. OK, sorry, I'm just getting hallucinations now. Must be the Red Bull. Um, yeah, the, uh, so the basic sort of idea is two basic fit sort of clumps of um, description, which I'm going to go through in two slides. If I'm on the right screen. Hello. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> so um, the basic two ideas um, are, that's actually quite evil, isn't it? That really didn't render at that resolution. Um, the, the, so the basic two ways of expressing the changes I want to make to the unpacking and removing of packages. The first one can be classified as filters. Um, the basic idea is to split the unpack and remove process into two. Um, the first sort of step of this will be um, taking the data about the file you want to install or remove and passing it through various filters um, to turn it into things. Um, a deep package divert would be a filter that takes this data about the files to install and changes the path appropriately. And um, stat override again would be kind of this filter which would alter the state, states of the file in the metadata before passing it to the thing that actually installs or removes it. Um, the filters would be um, basically a it can be a built into D package, but the default ones will be like divert and stat override and do nothing. Um, they'll be able to be provided as by a system administrator, so they can be a script on the disk or something like that. They can also be shipped in a package, so a package that knows it wants to do mass filtering of its own package list could ship a filter. It would probably be a bit evil if people did that too much, but um, there, are, there are a couple of good reasons for it. Um, it means we can do mass diverts through things like FHS transitions and stuff. Um, because the filter is a script, you can actually then go, well, anything beginning user lib gets moved here. And um, the, the, the second stage install and remove process would actually see the, uh, the result of gets moved here. So you can do kind of move the whole of user lib to user lib i486 Linux, mass divert um, with this system, and do it. And in fact, actually, then there's no particular reason you need to change the packages at all. You could probably do multi-arch by just making sure multi-arch systems diverted the whole of user lib and the whole of user include into the right directories. 
So <coughs> that could be a one way of doing it. There's a hmm? it's it's cute. It's evil, but it's cute. Um, the, hmm? Relocate. Ah, the, the, you could do that kind of thing with this, yeah. But the idea here is the, the idea here is basically to specify the unpack process and remove process as two stages. The first stage is you get the metadata out of the pack. Oh, hey Zeus. Huh? Oh, um, he was making a joke about RPM relocate. As far as I can. Was it? What were you saying then? <laughs> Do you mean relocatable packages, or do you? Yes, we can. Re so, so the question was there: could, with, with this, could you do relocatable packages? The answer is yes. The package itself could put a filter in to actually do whatever it needs to do to relocate things to different hierarchies and stuff. But the idea, yeah, the idea here is to split the unpack process and remove process into two stages. One is given the package and its list of files, modify that list and the data about those files to fit the system it's going to be installed on, and then there's a second stage coming up in a minute, which. Um, We'll, we'll show. We'll move to that slide now. So the second stage, after we've filtered everything, is we have this thing called classes. Now, just a random question. Um, I'm not expecting any hands. Has anyone actually used in earnest the Solaris package management tools? Yeah. A couple. Anyone use them enough to know about classes in Solaris's package manager? Oh, good. I can claim to have invented it then. <laughs> um, the, um, the, the basic idea, the, the term is just stolen directly from Solaris, and we'll almost certainly not be using these two terms. They're just convenient for this talk. Um, so the idea is, after you've taken the, the, after you've passed the package file data through a filter to turn it into what you actually want to put on the disk, the job of the class is to put it on the disk or, or take it off the disk again. So um, every file in every, every file in sort of in the, in the class is um, run through the class itself. Um, don't confuse this with object orientation, it's just a really bad name and I apologize. Um, basically, every file in the package will be given a class, which, which will default to the default class. Um, an example of other classes you can have is conf file, um, which is, exists today. Um, another one is documentation. You could create a documentation class. You can create translation classes. You, could you can create whatever classes you like. What the class t does to the file is it selects which piece of code drops it onto the disk and which piece of code takes it off again. So by setting things into the conf file class, the three-way merge conf file foo could actually be run instead. And this gives us an elegant way in the script. The thing was just using like, two function pointers, basically, to select which code is actually going to do it. Um, but um, you can also then, um, again, just as you can do with filters, the, um, system, the some can be built into dpackage. Um, some can be provided by the system administrator as a shell script or whatever and, conf and configured. And some can be provided in the package. So the package itself could um, provide a, um, so a, invent a class for some of its files and provide a script to lift the files out of the package and put them on the disk in the right place and take them off again and do the various kind of wi widgetry that is actually needed to do that. Um, they run after the filters, so they only see the filtered metadata. So if they, all things would work through divert, all things would work through that override. So there wouldn't be need to be any special magic to make conf file diverts work because conf files take place after it's been filtered. It would just work, um, and so on. Um, again, because they're customizable, um, the class is consigned for each file or falls back to the default. Um, the, the nice things you get are two kind of special types of class you can invent at this point. You can have a do nothing class, which can be installed by the system administrator. That's a class script that actually literally does nothing. Um, these can be used to, on embedded systems, to just not install the documentation. So uh, you can just have a class script, the doc um, class, which doesn't do anything. So you end up with a package on the disk without its documentation. And you can use this to switch between the classes. Yes? <laughs> so, just, I'll repeat. So the idea is you'd use globs and would you assign, the question is would you use globs and assign sort of them to hierarchies and stuff? Yeah, um, there are, there's various possibilities to that. I mean, you, the details of the implementation will be as hopefully as elegant as possible and simple as possible to use, but the sort of the underlying thing will be that um, 
you can the you know, files in this class go through this process to be installed, files through that one go to that process to be installed. Um, I said you get optional content, so you could have um, the do nothing class for user share in multi arch packages. So you can sort of just exclude the entirety of one hierarchy in stuff that you don't want. Or you can have remove only classes. Um, a remove only class would be a class that only implements the remove method. So you could register, yeah, so I'll get to say, you could register uh, log files in your package, not install them, but have a remove process to actually take them off the disk again when it's purged. Yep. Uh, but what happens if I, um, after I've installed a package, I change the filter and the uh, classes configuration and then I remove it and it's only half removed or is this information stored anywhere? Or? That's a very good question actually. So the question was, I don't know if everyone heard it, was what happens then if you change your filter and class configuration? Um, the truth is, I haven't quite decided yet. Um, the, obviously, changing the filter and class information will actually um, affect what the package is on disk. So there is a possibility you'd be able to refresh a package and rerun it through it, but you might need the original deb for that, or at least parts of it, um, or you just wait to the next upgrade. I mean, that's, they're, they're, there's no different than changing a divert now. I, I'm tending towards the fact it should just work. Um, it should do the right thing in all circumstances. And I, they're, they're, it's actually kind of easy to do that. You just rerun, sort of, you deconfigure, unpack, configure it again, and that should just work over an entire system. There's no particular reason with this model. It shouldn't be easy. Um, the, um, so you could change an embedded system to a real system by just dropping, by restoring the documentation in place. Um, which actually, bring, which again, is, is kind of useful. Both of these things require that we can, we can store a little bit more information about the um, package itself, um, and particularly the files in it. So we can do things like this. So what we end up with is a whole section on metadata, um, which is a horrible little term. Everything becomes a metadata problem at some point or other in its life. Um, so, yeah, to be able to do things like um, know what filter or know what, what happened and know where we put a file and whether we put it on the disk or not and things like that, we actually need to be able to store data about it. Um, so what we do is we keep a record of every package, like we do now in the status file, but we also keep a record of every file that's supposed to be in that package or could be in that package. Um, we keep information about what its file name is going to be, what its file name was before the divert filter took it, the stat override filter took it, etc. Um, we record its permissions. It's supposed to be its permissions that put full stat over. I took it. Um, we, took, we take its um, MD5 sums or SHA1 or something that won't be broken, broken this week anyway. Um, so we, we can kind of store that information. Um, obviously, we probably need something a little faster than RFC 822 that we've been using now. In fact, to be entirely fair, we need something a little faster about three or four years ago when Debian reached a certain size. Um, but I have absolutely no reason why we don't keep the status database. It's very useful. I mean, you can open it in a text editor and stuff. So possibly an index for it or some sort of basic things. Anyone who's heard Tridge do a recent talk, you might have heard him mention that I've been looking at LDB and the TDB backends he's written for Samba, which are extraordinarily fast and efficient ways of indexing it and still having an RFC 82 text file alongside it and being able to just edit it and the, the binary data gets put back into place. There's some quite cute stuff he's done with that. But the basic idea is, obviously, is to extend the, ex the um, existing status information um, to include information about the files. Um, we'll also allow sort of later additions to the database. So we'll allow you to register a file in the post inst um, with the addition of classes and sort of be able to say this is a log file, is not shipped by the package, but is removed. This becomes a little less useful, but there's still reasons why you might want to say well, this file has just appeared, I've just created it, register it as this information. And so you can stick additional entries in the database later. Um, and of course, you can just ship the information package. Um, the other nice thing you can probably do um, is um, create a signature of the metadata of a package. So you can create a signature based on the, all the files in the package and their checksums and stuff like that, and sign it. Um, and you can compare this to the same signature that comes in the deb, so you get a very cheap tripwire-like process. Um, you can compare the SUSF on the system, the, the, the digest on the system, build it all together, sign them, compare that to the same data in the deb, the signatures match, you've got a um, system that hasn't been compromised that way, um, which some people seem to think is important. It's also kind of useful when, I think probably that's more useful when you've got a hard drive on the way out. Um, it's a very good way to kind of see where the hard drive's dropped holes. Um, but it does actually create a, the first possible use for signed DEBs that 
I know of that isn't um, already satisfied by the signed apt repositories. Um, so we get sort of, so they're the basic three ways of changing the unpack and remove processes. So rather than um, having a single 1,000 line function, which does the whole job of unpacking and uh, package, we split it into kind of, you know, pick a filter, run it through the filters, pick the class, run it through the class. It becomes quite simple and elegant, and we can actually do repeatability and stuff with it, which hopefully will get us a little bit more reliability between upgrades as well. Um, other things we're just going to mention. Is there any questions about that first? The, the thing about signatures on, on package files is they're actually useful since you can do it if you don't have the complete repository available. Indeed. But it's also not just about trust, it's also about mistrust, since you can just say, I trust your archive, but not everything that this specific maintainer does. Yes. So I can just invalidate his key in the package. Yeah, there, there are other uses for them. There, there's, um, signed debs are, they have use cases above and beyond just pure verification of an error. They're actually sort of for trust of the individual builder. You can choose not to elect, you can elect not to trust a particular build D and so on, yes. So that, that gives you the basic undone of sort of the unpack and remove stuff. Um, so the next slide, we started off with what's not going to change. So we, we kind of go back to what's not going to change. It's kind of a big thing about what I want to do is not change a lot of things. Um, so these are things that people have suggested or probably in more particular, shouted, um, which we're probably not going to, well, when I say probably not going to see, they're not, we're not going to see them. Um, this slide's especially for b <laughs> Anyone who follows Formula One will know HP gave the Williams team a hell of a lot of money and a lot of computers, and they came up with this really bad nose for the car that just didn't work. <laughs> um, the, so there we go. Things we won't see in D-Package 2, and I'll explain why. Um, a lot of people seem to think that a source RPM and a source DEB are the way forward. A single file containing the, all the tarballs, all the patches, the instructions to build it, the metadata about it, and everything like that. Yeah, it sounds initially fine. I mean, they're easily to download. I mean, you can point someone at it, and they just have to download one file. Upload. Now, that's where the interesting comes. So let's take a small package a couple of people maintain. I don't know if they're in this room. Open Office. Every single time you change a patch, you have to upload all of the original source again. We don't have to do that at the moment. You just upload a new diff. Um, so that hurts the poor ADSL line or hopefully multi-tier T1 that open office maintainers will probably need anyway. Um, yeah, that's kind of bad. I mean, X is another example. Every little change to the patches would need to upload the original source again. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> and um, there's another person who tends to sob when you mention this, Elmo. He cries about his poor little mirrors who would be getting the multi-terabits of data as all the new upstream sources came in a thousand times a day with every... yeah. We don't want to do single file source packages. Um, okay, they're, they're easy to download, but quite frankly, apt get source is easy. In fact, actually, apt get source is easier because you don't have to ferret around and learn the structure of the pool. Okay, for developers like us, we probably do know the structure of the pool, but most people shouldn't need to. Give them a little tool like apt get source is fine. The other thing is source RPMs, if anyone's ever used them, are a bitch to unpack. You need RPM on the system, and then you generally need to be root because it wants to stick them in user source RPM. And, you need to be root to build the things because it's not made them as, you know. They're, they're actually not really that great. I mean, that, you know, dpackage source at the moment is pretty useful. I mean, it, you can do it as a normal user and you don't need any special real tools. You can just grab the files off the pool yourself and then tar them and patch them yourself. It's not too bad. Yeah, Ben? I, I build uh, RPMs not as root. You do build RPMs not as root. How do you do it? Do you have to change anything about the configuration to do it? Yeah, well, so, yeah. So, so he said he builds RPM not as root, but he's had to change the configuration of things to actually let him do it. It's possible, but it's, it's a bit difficult. Yes? So, so two file source packages, three file source packages. Um, the current Debian source package, I'm sure you'll know, is three files or two, a tarball, a diff, and a DSC, where the diff is optional in the case of native source packages. I'm guessing what you'd want is a um, DSC somehow encoded into the tarball or patches. It loses you the, um, the method, the sort of data attached to it. I mean, you don't, the thing is, you don't need the DSC if you don't want to use dpackage source. It's entirely possible to download just the tar and the diff and do it yourself. The DSC is an optional component of it. So 
you know, at the point you're getting that efficient, if you, the, the efficiency of three folds is assuming people are downloading them themselves. If they're downloading them themselves, they can unpack them themselves because they're, they're, they're built with everyday tools. So I tend to think having the separate DSC is nice. It's, it's like having a um, readme on an FTP mirror of an, uh, uh, your upstream source or a release notes alongside it. It actually turns out to be quite nice. Um, one thing I would like to put in, though, is the last changelog entry in the DSC because that's one thing I keep on doing. I keep on going to source packages and re trying to read the DSC to find out what it actually changed. But that probably belongs in the changes file, but we don't stick those on the source mirror. So there's, there's something there that could be improved, but in general, I think the, the current source package format is generally right, other than the tweaks we've already started with Wig and Pen, which are you know, supporting a few of the more evil things everyone tries to do. Um, I think everyone's read that announcement, um, read the description of Wig and Pen, have they? Or does anyone, stick your hand up if you'd actually like me to explain the differences. Okay, a couple of people. Vicky, obviously keeping up to date with the package, now he's <laughs> no longer the maintainer. Um, the basic idea of Wig and Pen is it's a pub in Canberra. They don't do very good beer. Don't go there. Um, it's also the name of the source package format. Um, the, um, the basic idea is rather than a tar and a diff, what you allow is a tar and a tar. Um, a lot of people now are shunning the idea of shipping a diff um, which, you know, single monolithic diff with all the changes, and are instead moving towards shipping just a collection of patches in the Debian directory. Um, the tar just lets them tar up the Debian directory with those patches and ship that as a tarball of patches and Debian directory and have dpackage source automatically apply those patches when it's unpacked. So it takes a lot of the, um, the hard lifting that you have to do at the moment. It also is allows, extended to allow multiple original tarballs. So a glibc, um, would become sort of a set of tarballs and a Debian directory tarball. Um, it's a slight it's sort of improvement. It doesn't break sort of the existing tools because it's backwards compatible. The, the current source package format is still sort of technically correct under it. But it allows those people who do need kind of extended things like to sort of avoid some evilness like tarring up tarballs and kind of creating original tarballs that actually contain changes because they were binary files. Or it allows us to get rid of some of the sort of the evilness we do there. Um, so again, yeah, I touched on this earlier. Um, again, I don't think we want a spec file to replace the Debian directory. I think personally that having the separate files in the Debian directory aren't that complicated. It means you can read exactly the right file that you want. Um, I mean, if you can imagine having the change log control mixed together with the rules and stuff like that, it would just get a bit unwieldy. Um, you know, having the separate files works. It's worked for us for ages. The tools pass them, and I don't really think it's that ugly. Does anyone else here think that's the Debian directory is particularly ugly? No? Uh, just. Yeah, I think that the spec file has an initial advantage. It's just one file to copy around between packages and edit. But, um, but it, yeah, it's, yeah, the, um, so having been told that it's, it is the ugly, people don't tend to know about it. And when people do, I've had, you know, been in a situation where I've worked for a company that was doing packaging of different um, operating systems. And, but after a few weeks, even the um, most cynical thought the Debian way was the best, simply because, um, it was the easiest to use. You could just, you, know, you just edited one file. You didn't have to go page, 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 page through the spec file to find the line you were looking for. Added to that, the spec file then stick post ints and pre and everything in there. Um, File-based dependencies is another one, which I'll just, I want to do the fourth one first. Um, post ints.d is another kind of thing if anyone's followed the um, long discussions that have kind of occurred as a result of it. Um, hmm? The SE Linux people, that's right. Um, basically, what it was is the idea of having a directory, post -inst d, pre -inst d, blah, 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 which you could stick scripts in that would get run every time a package's post -inst was run and every time a package's pre -inst was run and things like this. That's evil. And besides that, you could quite easily clock your PID counter several times during that run. But there's also the fact that, why do you want this? Um, I think that the, the stuff, if you, if you actually want to be able to see when another package is installed in this model, you would enhance it. Um, there's also, and then there's also this idea of triggers. Um, a trigger is something like um, ldconfig. Ldconfig could provide a script in a, tri <coughs> a trigger, um, and a package will go, I need ldconfig run at some point, and when the run is finished, um, dpackage would activate all the triggers, run the script. So you just run it once. Um, so you can sort of you know, get, get rid of the legwork. We can do this for scroll keeper update. You know, things that aren't needed to... Um, sort of until the end of the process and they only need to be run once for 100 packages, we can move to this trigger mechanism, which uh, anyone who's read the BTS will probably know of 
was speaking to the SE Linux guys about it for quite a lot. Um, and it turned out, of course, the SE Linux guys, what they really wanted was us to just stick the SE Linux context setting code into the same point as dpackage applies permissions to files, which is exactly what we did. And uh, Manoj sort of mumble um, did kind of that work and then did it again when he kind of tested it. Um, with the question was, would that be a filter? Um, a filter could certainly add the context information and the class could certainly apply it, yes. That was very much part of the um, design was at the same time. Have 10 minutes. Okay, so we go um, very quickly on to file-based dependencies and why we're not getting those. They suck. <laughs> um, the, for, anyone who's, for anyone who's used RPM, you'll know that RPM, you can depend on the existence of slash bin slash bash. Now try doing this when you've got apt involved. This is one reason why yum and stuff like that take forever to run, um, because you have to like, find which files contain bin, bash, blah, blah, blah. I think we can find a lot more elegant ways of doing this. Um, one of them is this idea of feature dependencies, which is this really unfinished brain dump of a horrible thing, which we're trying to find the elegance in. We're sort of, one of the way I design things which scares the living crap out of Elmo is that I go around the whole crackful route first to find out, and, and I actually, sort of, as you might guess from this, these slides, I find out what I really don't want to do first and find out what I do want to do in the middle of that. So um, there's kind of been talk about these feature dependencies and they're, they're kind of, they're not right yet, and, but I think there's a much more elegant solution for solving the problems file-based dependencies are actually trying to solve. <coughs> and I think the same for so named dependencies that RPM also supports. I think we, we can come up with something a hell of a lot better. I don't know what that is yet, but I'm willing to entertain ideas if anyone else has got any. Um, even if it's just policy of package names, to be honest, which is what we've done so far, but we've had some problems with that in the past. Um, so, how do we get there? Um, <coughs> wonderful circuit. Um, <laughs> the um, 113 is the current version of dpackage. Um, just a quick thing, I always get asked why it's 113. 110 was the previous CVS branch where we did all our work. 111 was the name given to CVS head, which didn't build, let alone work. So when I started actually kind of branching off and started doing my own stuff, um, I actually created a new development branch which went into, into experimental. I didn't want to call it 111 because CVS head called that. 112 sounded too stable, so it got called 113. It was the next free number in line, basically. Um, so we, we, come, we keep uploading that to Unstable now. We keep applying patches to it. You know, it carries on much as it has. And then we'll, in a few months' time, we'll freeze it, and we'll go for a freeze cycle, a translation cycle, which we'll probably do a 114. And that most of the major point of this is to test how long it's going to take to release it again. We may do another cycle, so we may get a 116 in etch, or a 118, or a 120, or we may even only get 114 in etch. But this is kind of the idea is here to make, deep, make sure dpackage is, all, is frozen and stable at the point we need to stabilize the release. Because we, we want to get Edge out the door. And then in parallel, the 2.0 work, this work outline, this slide will take place, probably <coughs> initially in just sort of a private archive, then maybe experimental. And it will all be done in parallel. The, the new code will be only arrive once it's been heavily tested and is already better than the old code. And 2.0 isn't even scheduled until Edge plus one. So we're looking at a little bit down the line, basically three year development kind of process for this. Um, there's uh, sort of some, some of the sort of, um, summaries, some of the problems people have with the code there. The fact that the main function of dpackage is in one file, which is 1,058 lines long, and it's just one never-ending function. Um, C-based exceptions melt people's minds, except Ian's. Ian likes them. And <laughs> some, I like them, but uh, some people like um, Some people broke never-free malloc a while ago, <laughs> and uh, brain-did it, dpackage memory management. And, there's been um, options for a library-fied code base as well, the idea of having a libd package um, apt could link to. And uh, that brings pretty much brings us to the end. Hello. Yep. Let's go back. Yes. Oh, right. So, sorry. Um, I sure should say that. So, basically, the process arc stuff is being taken care of by filters in classes. We, by moving the stuff into smaller functions that do the work and kind of... Oh, sorry, right. Um, the question was, the four bullet points for people's complaints, what am I going to do about them? Sorry. Um, so the process arc stuff, we split up into the smaller functions. We use the filters and the classes and things like that. And that breaks that function up into very small logical chunks, which makes sense. Um, the C-based exception stuff, I don't really know. I, I kind of like them. I think people who kind of hack on dpackage get used to them after a while and actually start missing them in other software. But then again, maybe this way of cleaning up the code a little, so that doesn't jump back to a completely different process like dpackage does at the moment sometimes. When it <laughs> um, 
Never free malloc has been broken. Well, we need to fix the memory management of D package. It needs to work on smaller systems. It needs to work on larger systems. There's, there's probably some fixes that can be done there, probably restoring some of the original intent of the code and kind of fixing it in other places. And librarified code base is definitely something I, I, I write all my software as a library with a shell around it. So that D package is going to gradually move towards that. Um, Possibly, yes. Um, in th sorry, the question was, do, do, does that mean I plan on rewriting dpackage source and, and by inference dpackage dev is not to be a twisted mass of Perl? Um, the, yeah, most likely it will probably get rewritten at some point. That's not on these plans. These plans are just about dpackage. In next year at DevConf 6 or in DevConf 7, and I might start talking about that. I mean, this is a three-year plan and this is the first six months to a year of it. Um, so we'll look at those kind of changes a little later down the line. But these, the basic fundamental things here is the idea of these filters, these classes, and improving the way we unpack and remove packages. So that pretty much does it. We'll just move on to about two minutes of questions. Five minutes of questions. My, his time's running faster than mine. Too far slower than mine. So anyone who wants to get involved, the website address is www.dpackage.org, which is the wiki, which basically anyone can brain dump stuff on and ideas on, and it's pretty much open to anybody who, can, what, who wants to log into it. Um, the um, mailing list, Debian D package at list DO. Um, that's pretty much a discussion list now. Um, mostly it's translations and uh, sort of ideas and stuff like that. Anyone who wants to subscribe to that and join in can. Bugs go to a different mailing list, Debian D package bugs. Um, join that if you want to help bug fix. Join it now. <laughs> Please, bug fix. Um, and um, lastly, this that's the URL where this these slides will probably be made available, if you can actually read that. <laughs> um, that's it, really. Any questions? Everyone's asleep. Um, Ian? Uh, a lot of stuff I'll talk to you afterwards. Yep. Um, for the moment, do you know that the DNS for dpackage.org is broken? Yes. Um, the question was, do I know the DNS for dpackage.org is broken? <laughs> the answer is yes. My ADSL line is down. <laughs> hmm? I would love a secondary. Uh, Matt? So the question was, how do I feel about expanding the metadata and control and putting more stuff in there? Um, basically, depends on what it is. Um, probably is this if we, we, you said you wanted to talk anyway, so we'll talk about what kind of things you want. Um, I'm not feeling ambivalent about it. Also, I don't want to add huge amounts of crap in there that aren't needed. Um, yeah, I, we need to know what it is first. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, can you speak up a little? I can't hear you at this point. How about uh, package description translations? Package description translations. Um, this is the how about package description translations. Translation of metadata in control. Um, yeah, I'd love to do it. Can someone come up with a solution that doesn't look, involve underscores everywhere and we'll work it out? Um, the main problem there is ship, shipping the translations, to be honest. Um, I'm open to suggestions on that. I don't know much about translation. Now, Christian Perrier, who was sitting around there somewhere, there he is, um, he basically, he's single-handedly, as a one-man task force, handled the translation of dpackage for about the last six to nine months, um, coordinating all the translators. He's working on sort of solutions to do man pages and stuff. You know, he's an excellent guy, and I'm sure he's going to have some ideas and talk to him, and he'll talk, talk to me in my language. It's probably a good idea there. Yeah, Jesus. Uh, hi. Uh, I have three questions, so I probably forget some of them. Uh, one of them, uh, we're still keeping the, the database, where the DPKG database, as a text file. It, there will still be a text file available. It may not be the primary thing that dpkg reads every time, but certainly if the text file is edited, it would regenerate its binary data, and if the binary data changes, it would regenerate the text file. The text file is not going to go away. Okay. Uh, second one, uh, are we going to be able to erase classes? You have, what, erase classes? What, like when to, once you define a class, can you, for example, define a documentation class that you want to have as long as your system has space, and then you can, when you run out of space, erase one class? Yeah, I, but the, I think you could do that. That's one thing you could do. You could certainly write the class that way. Um, and uh, the other question about uh, conditional dependencies. Ah, yes. Uh, could we add uh, new dependency fields, like dependency depends one, depends two? At that point, why didn't you just use a, a little dummy package? Um, the, uh, conditional dependencies are something I will wonderfully entertain the support of when we can come up with a syntax for it. Um, that you can do them today with 
can do with dummy packages. You can create dummy one, dummy two package, depend dummy one or dummy two, where dummies declare the, depend the dependency set. So there, you can do it today, it's just slightly ugly, but I haven't seen a less ugly way. Um, dep additional dependence fields like that seem to me to be ugly. And what is the other dependency condi uh, conditional dependencies that you were talking about? Sorry, the? You, uh, when, when I mentioned conditional dependencies, you said that there were two. Oh, the other thing people want is architecture specifics. They can say depends libc6 on i386 only, which currently use a control.in to parse. There's probably a way of doing that. Uh, the code base already lets you do it. It's, already, it's just commented out. Mm. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions? Okay, um, so everybody's stunned into silence and fearing for their lives or fallen asleep. So that's good. <laughs> Okay then, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, anyone who wants to come chat to me, I'm going to be hiding in the corner somewhere. So, definitely come down and speak to me, and I'm sure I'll entertain whatever ideas you have. Thank you.